I think we'll get started um, as people continue to come in. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I, um, I'm excited for tonight. My name is Marcia Eli. I am part of the BLP, BL, um, <laughs> BL, <laughs> BPL Presents team and also the director of the center programs for the Center for Brooklyn History. Um, and this is a, um, a sort of first for the Center for Brooklyn History, not for BPL Presents, in having a, um, an open meeting like this as a, as a public program. Some of you may know and maybe had attended the, um, the more formal program we had about a week and a half ago with Sarah Horowitz, um, who, as you know, is the founder of the Freelancers Union and uh, winner of a MacArthur Award and the author of the new book, Mutualism. Um, in that program, she moderated a conversation about mutualism with panelists who are practitioners here in Brooklyn of, of various kinds. Um, and, and in the spirit of mutualism um, and, and in our own excitement about this, I'll call it movement towards mutualism that we're all seeing happening now in the last year in particular, um, you know, we decided to follow up with a couple of, of, of group conversations, um, open group conversations that Sarah has very generously agreed to, to lead and be part of. Um, in order to, to you know, bring to the surface um, our collective ideas about this, this concept um, and, and practice of mutualism. So I wanted to, um, this is the first and there'll be another in the fall and you know, we'll see where that goes. Perhaps there'll be another after that. Um, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about, about how this will go. Um, we want everybody who um, the whole point is to give is to give all of you a chance to to express your own ideas if you so desire or not if you so desire listen if you so desire you know to put to put your thoughts in the chat um, you know or resources that you want to share in the chat and all of this is going to be documented we are taking notes we will have a transcript we will have the chat. Um, for this entire meeting, as well as the next one that we'll have later in the fall. Um, and that we're going to spin around um, and um, process and bake and present back out and share back out to the public um, and to you in the form of a, a chat book, a, print, a beautiful printed chat book and, and on our website. Um, and, and, and it's our effort to, to sort of, uh, you know, get this, um, push this, this, this conversation within our community about being community together um, forward and share um, and build together. So those are some of the things that you can expect will come out of, out of this hour. Um, again, in order to participate, we hope that you'll participate if you want to, if you're so inclined, it's brainstorming. There's no such thing as a bad idea. Um, Half-baked ideas, fully baked ideas, crazy. You know, all ideas are very much welcome. And the way to to join the conversation is is to raise your hand either physically in the screen or if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and you click reactions, you'll see a way to raise your hand. Um, so I think that's all that all the notes that I have to share with you. Um, and now I'm really happy to introduce Jakob Orsos, who is the vice president of the Brooklyn Public Library's Arts and Culture Department. And he's gonna say a few words of greeting as well. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much, Marcia. Yes, I'm the, I'm the head of the programming department. And as you can hear, I have an accent. I came to this job from Europe, I'm Hungarian, and it's important. It's important because to much of my surprise, landing in the library, I realized here, being very critical of this country and being very critical of this city, I realized that libraries are really unique, really amazing platforms here. 
as it opposed to Europe. Libraries are, are truly wide open democratic organizations and I got to love it. And it really I really admire it. And it's a fantastic job working with the group with my, with my team. It's a, there, it, everything is, is, is free in the library. We are presenting events left and right. There is no transactional, uh, uh, no transactional uh, uh, gesture there. So people can come in and, and share their ideas and, uh, and really contribute to one another's lives. And this is really important. Whether we are talking about literature, whether we are talking about philosophy, we always, and more importantly, we always talk about life. And here we are. We are here to talk to you and Sarah to talk about how we can make our lives better. And this is, this is actually one of the most important uh, missions of, the, of our library. So thanks so much for coming to this. And with this, and before I handing it over to, to Sarah, I just want to share one event what we completed a couple of months ago, which can actually inspire your thinking. At the, right at the beginning of the, fund, uh, of the pandemic, we started a town hall, uh, town hall uh, kind of like event series on asking people what they think is the next amendment of the constitution should, be, should, deal, uh, should deal with. We had 32 town halls over the course of months. And as a result of that, we, we managed to put together an amazing document. It's called the 28th Amendment, which we released online and in print too. So hopefully, this, this conversation about our lives and helping one another could result something similar to that. So again, thanks so much. Thanks, Marcia and Sarah, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, to Marcia, Jakob and Maya for, for making this happen. You know, one of the things I just did is I put everybody in gallery view so we could see one another. And um, if you, feel like you're eating and we're going to be offended by watching you eat, don't worry about it. So, you know, but totally understand if people aren't comfortable turning on their video, but, um, you know, what I'm hoping to do is to really have a conversation. And so it'll be nice for us to see who, who else is, is on the, on the, uh, zoom. So, uh, I'm Sarah Horowitz. Uh, I, uh, started the freelancers union and uh, as a result started to really see these ideas of how people come together and to see that in fact it's really a sector that we do this all the time. We do this in unions and cooperatives and mutual aid groups and in our faith communities and probably many other examples. And uh, what I want to do today is to go through what makes something mutualist so that you can start to decide for yourself what's, what's mutualist? You know, what do, what do you think and how would you apply it? And so I'm gonna go through the three elements of it and then we're gonna start to have a conversation about what makes a great ecosystem of mutualism. Let's make one up. And when I say make it up, I mean we can use real life examples or we can make up examples that we'd like to see but again, the goal is that we walk out of here with our own sense of what mutualism is and why it's so important. And that's really the third component. And so I'm gonna just quickly run through these, but feel free to um, chew on them, add to it, say what you think. Um, but really there are three elements that you can really see when you start to look back at really all of humanity, but let's just take American culture just for the sake of simplicity. So one is, instead of just saying, you know, hey, I'm for a good cause, it's really flipping things on their head right now and saying, what is the community that we're actually talking about? It can be a geographic community. It can be a shared community of people who have the same kind of work the same kind of belief system, but it's the community of human beings who are saying this is what they need and want. And the second is an economic mechanism. And strangely, this is my favorite one. And I think we can have a really good conversation about this because I, I started this thinking that people had to pay like dues or subscriptions or have some economic base to support their own community interests. So in other words, it's not charity where you're asking somebody else 
who is outside the community to help you, but you're really galvanizing the community. But over time, as I've had conversations, people have pointed out, what if it's an obligation to show up? What if it's time? Just to be really current, what if it's an alternative currency? So I think that we're starting to see that that one can, can really be something to talk about. And the third is really to have a longer term time horizon. So instead of a for-profit that's focused on very quick and big returns, we want to make it that whatever resources are in the community aren't extracted out, but start to cycle back in with a long term focus so that we don't just think about ourselves, we can think maybe the Iroquois say seven generations, maybe we say two, but just to start to think about something beyond the current human beings that inhabit the earth. So let me just, before we go into starting to co-create our own community, does anybody have anything that they wanna add? Anything that's like, you know, that makes total sense or you know what, don't agree with that at all. And um, of course, feel free, we'd love to see your face. So feel like, or, or you can put this in the chat. And in fact, I start to, I'm seeing, um, this is all from our friends at the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, anybody wanna add anything? Cause I can jump into the next question. Okay. Shifra, you look like you were going to say I can ask a question, which is, does it need to be a discrete body in your mind, like a, a group that is ongoing, has a boundary, or can it be a mutualism, can be a moment? I mean, like, what would be a moment? Like, say more about what, what you could. Now, running to the market for somebody, which theoretically is a long term, I mean, it's a short term moment, but theoretically you build relationships that that means someone would offer me their lemons, but um, but that's not, we didn't make a contract. We don't have a, we're just cultivating a kind of care. Yeah, well, let's, let's, let's see what other people think. I mean, I think what you're describing is if something is a reciprocal or kind activity, if that repeats many, many times over, we know that that would be part of something like you're in a tenant association mm -hmm. or a union and that would happen. I saw somebody raise their hand, but I'm not fast. Ah, Neil. And D, D, so Neil and then D. Okay. Neil, we can't hear you, you might be muted. And if not, we're going to go to D and then you can join. Okay, D. Is your name D or is it D standing for something? Okay, Neil, you're going to, I think we're going to have to mute you a little bit. And D. Fine. We are having a hard time hearing you, Dee. Okay, let's come back to you in a second. Was there anybody who wanted to, to discuss? Because I think what we're talking about is if it's a moment, then how does it have a long-term time horizon? you know, how do we pass wisdom or ideas from one generation to the next? And I think it raises a good point, Shifra, which is very good things may not be mutualistic, right? So it's not like one thing is good and one thing is bad. Um, okay, so now let's start to think about what would make a mutualist ecosystem? And I realize like that sounds like a big word. So let's just like, our big concept, let's just break it down and say, what are the things that you like in your neighborhood or your area or your community? And what would you like to see there? So let's just jump on in. Like what's in your community that you like that you think might be mutualistic or that you wish there were more of it? Paulette. Yeah, 
I may be going too far, but today I read an article. I forget. Okay, in um, I guess they highlight various things that go on in New York, and I was amazed to see they were highlighting various communities. How you have a part that's the Hungarian, well, maybe not Hungarians because the guy just said Hungarian, but you have so many separate communities. So for me, I mean, when I heard your definition, but when I think of mutualism, I was thinking it more in a wider perspective in the sense that, I mean, here America talks of being a nation for the free and everything else, yet you still have these little sectors that continue to exist as their own, in their own little communities without there really being any sort of overlap. So I was sort of interested, I mean, when I saw the, um, the Zoom advertise, I said, ah, this may be interesting to see what angle are you taking on this? I mean, I've gotten your you know, little description here, but what bothers me is that you talk of a community trying to be together, but still you have these disparate groups who are happy within their own little context and not really willing to, you know, look at it from a broader perspective. You know, I don't I, know what sense that, that makes. Yeah, no, no, that's, 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 really, um, that's really important. Is there anybody who um, wants to add to what Paulette said or respond? Just looking at the chat. So, you know, I think that sometimes we think that when people are in their own faith community or neighborhood group, that it necessarily means separate and apart. And actually, you know, when you look at people who are in faith communities, they tend not only to be more active in their own community, but to go out into other communities and be active. And so in some ways it's saying, when you are participating in these different groups, you're actually are part of the larger whole. But I think what you're saying is let's watch out and not forget that we are also part of a whole. But I would say that the promise of mutualism is that it gives individuals a way to not be so alone and to find people who are near them that they can start to connect to because we have such problems of anxiety, depression, loneliness. As we learned in COVID, people need help. As Schiffer was saying, like immediately mutual aid groups came along to say, wait a minute, we are part of the whole, but the best way that we exercise that is when we can be in those groups. Shiver, I couldn't tell if you had your hand up again or. I did, but I don't want to dominate. So it's sort of at the group's discretion. I don't see another hand up except Neil, but I don't know, Neil, if um, your hand is still up or you want to join us. Yes, I, 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 I have to wait just at the moment. Okay, Neil, you know what? You get yourself ready because Shepard's going to make a point and then we'll come right back to you. Okay. I, I guess what I was going to say is that I really appreciate what it was a Paulette. I can't see everybody's screen now. Um, Paulette was saying. And I also recognize we're not, as much as humans might be interdependent, we're not, we're discouraged from it, I think, in the US in some kind of ways. So it, it, it's easier if we if it's facilitated in some way, if it's made available to us with people who have more intention to bring people who might not be comfortable or know how to move beyond their comfort zone and um, and know if it's safe. Can I and I mean emotionally, like can I approach people from a different neighborhood or a different faith community? Are they in the mood for that? Are they going to think who the hell am I? Or so I think. Sometimes it needs to be convened um, or invited in some way, rather than just assuming I'm going to go over here and invite these people to, you know, whatever. Um, you know, it, 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 I think people are generally receptive, not everybody, but a lot of people, but they don't know what the parameter, that's what I was sort of my earlier question, like, is there a boundary and what right. is it? Um, and how do people know what it is? And then some people come together in a mutual interest of like, we want to bring different communities together. So if that's the call, people will come together like to talk about race or to talk about criminal justice and the problems with it or 
you know, then people come together for these different, and, you know, like the bail bond process to try to buy people out and fight the bail system. Then people come together for a common cause. But if they're just like, who am I going to go buy groceries for? How do you, you know, like you have to have some prior connection in order to offer that or be in something that has a boundary. Yeah. Not necessarily <laughs> geographic, but like you're saying, a union or a. Good. Thank you, Shepa. Paulette, you were saying. I would say I agree fully with Shepa because, you know, and we have to make a concerted effort, I think, this country to really get back in on a good footing. A concerted effort has to be made. I mean, this whole Zoom business and COVID has been great because you've been able to interact with people from different segments. But, you know, it shouldn't have come to COVID to let it happen, but that's what it is. So hopefully we can take it forward. You know, I, I'd like to say this. You know, one of the things that I think we've all seen since the age of Ronald Reagan is that we think of ourselves so much just as individuals. And as that has happened, when we start to look at big measures of our economy, we see greater inequality, we see the decline of the organizations that enable people like you're saying to come together to say what they think so that they're not alone and weak as one person. And I think that's what we could think about. So like, I'll tell you, you know, what I love about my neighborhood in Brooklyn is there's like the Y. Well, the YWCA, you know, is, or YMCA is a longstanding mutualist organization they bring people together and you can go to the gym. And you can, if you're a new immigrant and you wanna learn English, there are classes. Um, and they really take their time to help the people in their area really get the things that they need. So instead of just like an elected official saying like, I don't know what people need, the why helps to aggregate them. And, um, a lot of people in Park Slope go to the food co-op that enables people to get food much more, um, really good food, high quality food that's really affordable. So you can still go to the supermarket, but you have another place to go. And so when I, I like to go to the, the Sea Town because the workers are in the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. And while people maybe don't like you know, reach great heights of euphoria about Seatown the way they do about Whole Foods, well, one workforce is unionized and the other one isn't. And I also have of late in writing this book and thinking about it, I like to go to the post office because I know that the people that work there have a retirement plan. And so I think that what we can do is start to see that mutualism is everywhere around us and that it really does a great service to our own communities, right? Like just a big example in New York City, I, I'm almost sure that like something like 12% of the workforce works for the city. And they end up, if you think about this, by staying in the city and paying their taxes and sending their kids to school, all the city workers don't just do their job, they have become one of the most important economic anchors in the city. So I invite you, like maybe we could just go around and think about something in your neighborhood that feels mutualistic. And maybe we could just, just start listing one or two things. And you can use mine too if, you know, because, you know, feel free, but love it or something in history or something that you find particularly interesting. Um, so would love to hear um, any thoughts on that because one of the things, and let me just shut up and then we'll get to the next thing. So let's hear, let's hear. And we'll literally listen to birds chirp. I see Musa has a hand raised. Oh, okay, perfect. Musa. I actually wanted to contribute a little bit to uh, Paulette's point earlier. Okay, would you, would you also be kind enough to also just talk also about a mutualist thing in your neighborhood that you like, but make your point first, but if you could add one, that would be super helpful. 
Yes, I can start with that. Uh, we have a community garden uh, that we started and uh, we also have a neighborhood association that sometimes we just call uh, people to come out and just clean up the neighborhood. Uh, people get to meet their neighbor, we talk, we communicate. And I think it's, 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 it's very good and very positive. Um, I think it is almost a natural uh, phenomenon to just gravitate around people that share the same values mm -hmm. um, and have common interests. But I think what's important is the byproduct of that. If the byproduct if to, is to strengthen the individual, then that's very positive. But the byproduct, if the byproduct is exclusive, mm -hmm. right? I think then it can cause, you know, uh, more tension in a larger community. Yeah, I, I, you know, I really feel like you've put you and Paulette and others have really, you know, centered the discussion around that. And I think that what's important is if we if we don't watch out for a kind of tribalism and exclu exclusion, especially where people of power with power are able to kind of create their own communities that are separate and apart, you know that that's that's not good, obviously. And and we have to not just say that's not good, but um, build in systems to prevent it, especially around discrimination, which we have in the US, arguably not working well enough, but we have race discrimination laws and government organizations. But I think one of the things that happens in our culture in the last 30 years is that we have stopped saying to ourselves, how do we both reach out to people who are different, but around commonality that we actually have? the commonality that we have for a garden, the commonality that we have for affordable medicine or care. And so it prevents us from organizing. And I think what's happened is we don't have the power that we need to because we keep just critiquing and not building. So Musa, can we take your example of the community garden and ask people like what, what other things brings people together in the neighborhood so that they're connected to one another. Don't be bashful, I swear, being on camera is not painful. Anybody a member of a food co-op? A community garden? A union? a credit union, anybody bought Lando Lakes butter at the supermarket, gone to Ace Hardware? Anybody gone to an Ace Hardware? Do you know where that is? That's a mark, okay, Steph, Stephanie. Is that, is that a co-op or is that a unionized shop or what is that? So it's really interesting, but Ace Hardware is a marketing cooperative. So local hardware stores can buy their inventory collectively, and then be under the ACE banner so that people can have trust knowing the brand will have the products that, the, that people trust and need. I never knew that. Paula. I never knew that, I've been to ACE Hardware. I mean, I'm coming from a little, two extremes in the US. Um, I came to the US in 1960, my kids were born here, but I always worked for the UN. That was my career. Uh -huh. But then when I retired, my husband's job transferred him to Texas. So we've been living in Texas from 2000 and I'm calling from Texas now, but I'm back in New York now, sort of on a part-time basis because I have my first grandchild because my children mm -hmm. are born in New York. And I think Texas has influenced me in my sort of describing that sort of little communities because um, I find, I was amazed actually, the fact that all my life I was in New York most of it and living in other countries because of the UN, to find a place like Texas where, I mean, where I live, I sort of hang with seniors because I'm senior now, 
but it was amazing to find out how little they knew of other communities, especially the Latinos, the Blacks. I mean, I was in shock that how could people be living all these years? And it's, you know, like, ah, uh, they had no, absolutely not a clue of how these other little communities operate. And it really bothered me because, I mean, if I say Texas is basically the largest sort of segment of how U.S. feel, um, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, I was amazed. I've been trying since 2009 to do my bit in, you know, especially I was there doing the Obama's two tenors. Oh boy, did I go through horrors. But I mean, it was all the time trying to hit back and tell them, where do you get these ideas from? It was amazing. I mean, now I'm back to New York, I'm sort of more relaxed again. Everyone kept telling me, why are you killing yourself trying to make these folks be a little bit more broad-minded? Yeah. But I felt obligated to do it. I was shocked to find that this is the brand of, you know, so I am, I may be talking from real crazy perspective. No, no, no. You know, I, I think that you raise a point and I'd love to make this kind of a way for us to think together. So number one, we started talking about mutualism and one of the biggest concerns raised was what about especially groups that have power being exclusive. But actually, when you start looking at mutualism, the very groups tend to be the ones that bring people together. So let's say you were going to form something in Texas to bring people together. You know, what, what would be the first things that you might do? Right, like, let's just brainstorm. Like, you want to bring different people together. What, what do you think your first steps might be? Okay, one thing there, the church is a big thing, as you know, it's a Bible belt. That's so, the mutualism base. Sure. So um, I'm an Episcopal, so of course I went to the Episcopal church, but even there, I mean, going to the Episcopal church in New York was totally different to going to it. In yeah. Texas. You know, I always felt that, come on guys, this is not, we are the only saved group on the earth. And you know, it was always a we and a they. I play bridge with another group. It was the same thing. And I'm like, what is going on? When will they reach out to the other community? Okay, so now let's pretend we're making up the church of our dreams, right? So now we're waving a magic wand. And you could imagine there's the church and it has a building. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, we can tell you're an organizer. So, um, now there is the church, like what does a faith-based group have over almost any other group space? So you could start to invite people to come to the space. And there are lay leaders and church leaders. And you could say, would you ask some of the other faith leaders to make an announcement that we're going to start to have a meeting to talk about this and is there a way that we could have some food okay so immediately now you've now got some space you've got leaders who are trusted by their own communities making announcements plus putting it out on social media and you can imagine now that one person's voice has now reached many people using that infrastructure. And that's what I think we have to go back to. Like when Musso was talking about the community garden, first of all, as a gardener myself, you know, there's just something beautiful about being in a garden. But I bet you a million dollars that people celebrate different life events in that community garden and feel really connected because there's space. There's a way to announce a meeting. So if people could think about somebody, I, was it Emily? Erica, um, was Erica Ashley, was talking about public transportation and the way we connect, but maybe can people think about other examples of like what, if you were waving a magic wand, what would you want in your city, your neighborhood, your library, your faith organization, anywhere? What, like, what, what do you think would make society better? Okay, I'm gonna ask it a different way. What, what would you like to see done differently? 
housing, food, vacations, um, childcare. I mean, I think we're, I think that there's like these two kind of, I mean, it's not oversimplified to say two, but these kind of competing threads, which we saw in, you know, high relief over the pandemic, but the kind of, I got to get mine co competition mindset that like, I, and I got to be ahead of everyone else. If everybody has them, what I have is less is value, less valuable. And then there's the, the kind of more human impulse of people of the ways mutual aid has emerged and people are caring for each other, sharing resources, recognizing like I got all the wipes and you got all the toilet paper and we'll be okay between us, you know, like this or the hand sanitizer, whatever, like not feeling like I have to stockpile against everybody else, but that really we are more, we're stronger when we're together. But that's so counterculture to the kind of dominant American narrative. I, so let's just like put like a nice little frame around what you just said, because I think there's a bunch of things. So number one is, I think we have to say that there's this dominant in hyper individualism, but that actually we have a whole sector that's like a trillion dollar sector of the faith communities, union pension funds, that there's so much infrastructure that it's not true that we're hyperly individualistic. Actually, we have wonderful other traditions. And the second thing is mutualism gives you a way in, right? I bet you that almost everybody here has been in a Facebook group. I bet you that everybody at one time has been in like an alumni association. You know, that, there, that at one time or other, you've been in something. And what I'm saying is let's pay attention that there's actually a way to do this. There's a, it's like if you were starting a startup, you would be able to Google, how do I start a startup? And someone would say, here are the first three steps. But mutualism has that too. And what it promises is that you are not alone in whatever it is you're trying to figure out. And we have like technology and ways to find other people online through meetups, through Facebook groups, or through your local faith community. And when I say faith community, it doesn't have to be any type of faith. It could also be yoga studio, ethical culture, society, any place where you're communing, you know, with a feeling of something greater than yourself. And I think that a lot of times people feel like, is there anybody who sort of feels like uh, this all sounds good, but I still have no idea how I would do this in my own life or how it would be relevant. I feel like, Nicole, you're on the verge. Okay, no, should we let you pass? Okay. Um, all right, so look, hey, I Musa think- that's his hand raised again. I don't know if you saw that. Musa? Okay, thank you know why you're like, you're on the top left-hand corner of my screen. So yes, please. Oh, you may be, are you I'm, muted? I'm having problem changing the color of the, it, it's hard to see. Um, the, uh, I, I think having this community garden, for example, the collective cleaning that we have in our neighborhood, I think what it builds is also trust. Um, I remember, I am from West Africa. So my mother came and visited me when I used to live in Harlem in an apartment. And she was surprised that I didn't know my neighbor. That is just the apartment next door. And she, she the first, her reaction was, what about if you run out of salt, what would you do? It was like, I'll go to the store. It's like, you can't knock on your neighbor's door and ask for salt. It's like, no. Uh, and she asked me why, and I didn't know really what answer to give her. The idea is trust. I don't trust enough maybe my neighbor or I'm not comfortable enough to knock on her door and ask for whatever I need. I think having these community gardens, having even a park where people gather together and have a barbecue and having, I think, build 
enough trust so that you can reach out to the other person. Yeah. Cool. You know, I, I, so, I so think that is the heart of it. It's trust and love, you know, because, you know, sometimes I, I think about, I don't know if you experience this, but, you know, I, I feel like not only is the news hard to listen to, but it's very hard to know um, what to trust by way of information. And I think one of the recurrent messages that I think is actually really not true is how much you cannot trust people. And that's where if we have a crisis, it's in that and we have to rebuild that. Like the, really since the 1960s, like the data, and if you're interested, it's Robert Putnam who wrote a wonderful book called Bowling Alone. And he just wrote a new book called The Upswing, which you can get at the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, and it really shows that since the 1960s, we have pretty much destroyed these kinds of organizations. And it's not just the Republicans, you know, it's not just conservatives, it's also liberals because once we start to think that every individual just goes to government or every individual just goes to the economy or to business, we lose all of what builds our trust in one another. And, you know, if I'm here to say one thing, it's there's really a way to start at the moment that you have a need, instead of going on Twitter and complaining about it, start to think about how you build, you know, to Musa's point, you know, who are your neighbors? Are they having this? Do you live on a block? Do you live in an apartment building? Can you just put a sign up that you're going to meet for like, uh, you know, something to drink? Um, you know, do people want to form an organization? And you'll see that the crazy thing is that the places that have the most of that are the places that people tend to want to live in. The neighborhoods that have it tend to be the safest. And it's not really correlated just with class. And I think that once we start to view this as like an exercise regimen, that you can actually get better at it and that you can go to people who are actually good at it and learn from them in unions and co-ops and faith communities and go and find out the places that you can. So um, I know that we're, Shifra, jump in. And I know that we're wrapping up um, mm -hmm. because I think that the, the last thing that we could talk about just for one minute is the role of, of government, but I don't know if we're gonna have enough time, Marsha. So yes, okay. So Shifra, why don't you say that? And then we can start to think about you know, is this whole mutualism just crazy and we should just have government do everything? Is that where we're more comfortable? You know, is that where we are as a country now? So Shifra, jump on in. Well, I mean, I, I think that question is the same tension. There's the people who think government is rescuing people that are too lazy. And there's the people who feel like the, the small government people and the people who feel like government is the biggest infrastructure of mutualism if we do it right. And if we actually all pay taxes, which is a whole other conversation. But, um, but I think, you know, there's just this, I mean, the tension is real. And I think we, it's hard to erase the, the, the white American overlay. I think immigrant communities are not, new immigrant communities have more, come with more mutualism a lot of times, especially if they come from collectivist countries, like the, the, the cultures. I think what white American culture has done is really do that dismembering, but it still exists in those other, in, in other pockets and people who are doing it more intentionally, like in building kind of mutual aid and co-op things. But I think that individualism kind of thing comes from this old, I think, white American way. Well, you know, it's interesting because that independent and, you know, all that and not interdependent and not, I mean, just the scarcity and competition that feels like a, a white cultural value to me. Paulette, it looked like you were gonna say something. I mean, I agree with Moose said that the trust is the big thing. And I feel even when these immigrant communities, I mean, New York has a few, you know, they get together, they want to reach out. They want to be a part of America. I mean, they come here to really become integrated into the society. They don't wanna continue with, you know, 
I mean, they come to improve themselves. So of course you want to be a part of the mainstream. So they're willing to reach out, but I find that, you know, it's sort of hard building, bridging that gap where you really can feel you've arrived, you're a part of the community, people can see what value in you, it may not correspond totally with whatever they feel are the way to be. But most people don't come here with an individualistic sort of viewpoint to say that you have to get ahead and so on. Most of them come from extended community background. So be, they believe in a community spirit. So it's just bridging that gap. And, yeah. and also, you know, when you look at every, every um, immigrant group, every group, every peoples has a built in mutualism so that you know, just looking at New York as another example, th almost always through faith communities, people collectivize their money and create a pool that's like a lending circle to help people do well. And I think that's the greatest irony is actually that when you come and connect with groups, that's actually your best bet of how you're going to do well. It's it's really much more likely than, you know, just one lone person who, you know, discovers whatever and becomes fabulously wealthy. That's just statistically an aberration. And so I think it's, you know, when we start to think about this, you know, to me like the black church is the the the, the mutualist all-star because it's always been since the AME Zion Church and others been the way for people to come together to be their own leaders, to have self-determination of their own, their own communities. So it's actually the opposite of separating. It's actually the way to articulate need and to start with an action plan and to then communicate to government what government needs to do not wait for people to come and listen and then tell you what they're going to do. Um, I just see somebody in the chat. Um, sure. Claudia, did you want to jump on in? Or not? Happy to, we can look at your, your point if that's what you'd prefer. So Claudia's writing as a person of color in a white neighborhood, it makes it difficult to integrate into the community, um, especially given the past administration and not knowing whether other people, um, where are you there, uh, in the community are aligned or not with the values that caused January 6th. Um, ah, and Mike not working. I'm sorry, I'm such a, a poor substitute for a microphone, but I, I really think that that's a really good point that you know, like just thinking of what Claudia just said, if Claudia is alone and is feeling uncomfortable, it's it's hard for other people in the community that want to do well by Claudia to do something because they don't know her. But if Claudia can find a few other people and then start to say, we're, we're meeting in this bar or this restaurant for dinner, please come, and then start to articulate that, then they can say to their city council person, like this is how, do you see what I mean? So the point isn't that um, we're all gonna know, um, there's no one way to do this, but there is a kind of secret sauce to this, which really gets to Moose's point, which is A, you have a problem or a concern or something you wanna work on, there's gonna be other people. Try to find your first few, try to then build trust and let that trust expand out. And then you can start really making your group meaningful. There's really tried and true ways. And it's, it's already happening. You know, Facebook groups, people are in them. You should get off them because they're all about their own algorithm and other things. But you can go find people, do this at a very small scale, but start to realize how it's interconnected. Find your local groups. Um, and see how you can join a credit union. You can start to notice it. So when people start to say, we're a country that's just about hyper-individualism, you could say that's true, but we're also a country that has this other tradition that we have to stop making invisible because every ethnic and racial group has a beautiful and powerful history. And if we see it and find it, it inspires us 
for the next generations and ourselves. Um, so I know that we are running out of time, but we're gonna do one, one quick experiment. Um, so as you've been talking and thinking and hearing, is there like a word or words that come to mind that you could just add to the chat and we can all look at the chat and see? And it could be any, any word that's kind and respectful. Um, and let's just see what we think. Any, any word come to mind, any thought? So I'm just gonna to start to read them and let's, and we're gonna include these in the book that um, Jacob was talking about and see, we have empathy, relearning trust, symbiosis, inclusion, interdependence, trust, discovery, sharing resources without fear or lack, space, there aren't enough spaces real spaces for people to come together. Okay, anybody wanna grab a few more before we go? So, um, Marsha, I think I'll just do a quick wrap up and then if you wanna, if you wanna wrap, 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 wrap up. So, um, first of all, I really hope that we felt like you are not alone tonight, that I really enjoyed hearing from people who we didn't know each other before, but we've come together and we've done so because the, the library and the historical society gave us a vehicle and a place which is part of their mandate. And I hope that you come out of here with an idea of mutualism, that it's powerful and something that can really be a part of your life and probably shaped you by your parents and their generation, and that it's our obligation to kind of re rejigger this for the next generations and to start to really think about some practical tools for some very big ideas. So um, it's really been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much to Marsha and, um, and to Jacob and to all of you. Marsha, let me send this over to you. Yeah. Yeah, I want to echo um, Sarah's thanks. And I, I want to say I've been watching the chat and I see that, you know, Colin is from Seattle and of course, Paulette, you've told us you're from Texas. And I'm very, I think there's some- Temporarily. From mm -hmm. Temporarily or partly. Temporarily. Or partly. Um, you know, I'm very, um, I think this is, um, I, I'd be very curious to hear where other people are from. Um, raise your hand or put it in the chat. I sort of can't believe I'm saying this because usually I shift us from Los Angeles. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we're painting a picture here of a national um, urge, um, a national need um, uh, to, to, you know, that crosses our states and crosses you know, across humanity here um, to grapple with this question of mutualism and how we can bring it into our lives. And I think that all of you are from so far ranging places. Um, it's uh, just yet another demonstration of that fact. So um, thank you all. Thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you all for your listening. Um, thank you for participating. Um, oh, Marsha, you know what I forgot? Forget. Um, if people want to stay in touch, they can just go to build-mutualism.net. And while Marsha's saying that, I'm just going to put that in the chat. Marsha, so sorry to interrupt you. No, no. 
And, you know, we are, of course, are curious about any residual ideas or thoughts that you have. You all, in fact, have an email. It's my name, Marcia Eli, M. Eli at Brooklyn Library, B-K-L-Y-N library.com. Um, feel free to use that and send things that pop into your head later or tomorrow or next week. Um, all of that will go into this pot that we're, um, we're, we're, we're you know, uh, percolating here. Um, and perhaps you'll join us again in the fall when we do this a second time. So on that note, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Take care. Nice seeing everybody. Okay, nice. Bye, <laughs> take care. Good night.